I sadly cast aside on misfortune's rugged tide? Will the world my pains deride forever? Must I dwell in slavery's night and all pleasure take its flight far beyond my feeble sight forever? Worst of all, must hope grow dim and withhold her cheering beam? Rather let me sleep and dream forever. Something still my heart surveys, groping through this dreary maze. Is it hope? Then burn and blaze forever. Leave me not a wretch confined, altogether lame and blind, unto gross despair consigned forever. Heaven, in whom can I confide? Canst thou not for all provide? Condescend to be my guide forever. And when this transient life shall end, oh, may some kind eternal friend bid me from servitude ascend forever. So, how do we connect this poem with Toni Morrison's beloved? Well, that's a good question. Obviously, there's the similar subject of slavery, the name of the poem being The Slave's Complaint, and the reasoning behind Setha killing Beloved being that she wanted to protect her from slavery, but we'll get to that in a little bit. To start off, let's talk about the meaning of The Slave's Complaint, which is the complex emotional struggle enslavement inflicts upon the enslaved. Uh, in the beginning of this poem, we see that the tone is very bleak and desperate to reflect the hardships of slavery. But then throughout the poem, we see that the speaker's attitude towards slavery evolves. And he uses lighter statements such as heaven, and he now sees hope as more than just a dream. And this represents his newfound optimism that his misery may not be permanent. And the speaker, perhaps unrealistically, believes that eventually he will escape the hardships of slavery. So with that being said, are we ready to move on to connections? I'll take that as a yes. First, I want to address the most distinctive po component of the poem, uh, the repeated use of the word forever. And not only was that the reason that I loved the poem, but it also parallels the fears faced by the characters in Beloved, namely Setha. Throughout the novel, especially in part one, we see that she struggles with rememories and she tries really hard to suppress her past and not relive any of those memories, but ultimately to no avail. And if you go to the way bottom of page 43, you'll see Setha recalling her reasoning to kill her children, and she anxiously warns Denver. If you go there, you who never was there, if you go there and stand in the place where it was, it will happen again. It will be there for you, waiting for you. So, Denver, you can't never go there. Never. Because even though it's all over, over and done with, it will always be there waiting for you. A few lines down, they even continue on to say that nothing ever dies. The fact that this quote uses was and will be clearly shows that um, the events endured by Setha that were so traumatizing and impactful have lasting effects, and not only on her, but also on those who weren't necessarily involved. And this uh, clearly shows that slavery, the traumatizing event, lives well beyond its apparent end and um, is almost everlasting and has uh, great implications. And so this kind of draws on the theme of the inescapability of the past. And with that, one of the most notable things throughout this novel is the hauntings of Beloved. And she has the power to make people remember things, such as Paul D. and his rusty tin can. Um, he finally is able to unseal that with her, and obviously with Setha. And it just shows that Beloved has the power to enslave the characters to their own memories. And uh, in the more recent chapter that we read, uh, Beloved's chapter, which starts on page 248, we see her with the images of the crouching people, the dead people, and the water. And that just draws on the fact that she is the middle passage. 
and because it's exactly how we can imagine the slaves to have experienced the Middle Passage and that just further supports um, the fact that Beloved is representative of slavery. And when we have that in mind and we look to one of the things that stood out the most in her chapter, which was, I am not dead. She repeats that about three times in her chapter and we see that slavery does not die. And that even though we believe that the era of slavery is over, it clearly is not. And it has lasting implications and lasting consequences that Morrison is trying to show not only on the people who experience it, but also in America. And that's very important to note. And the most obvious connection between this book and the poem, and the most significant connection, is that notion of the lasting impacts, and that's completely mirrored by the re repetition of forever in this poem. So both authors are trying to convey the fact that things have lasting implications, and we see that so clearly with Beloved, that she is representative of the physical, societal, and emotional consequences of slavery. One of the most interesting things to note in the slave's complaint is that in the last stanza it says transient life. And this isn't something that we would see echoed in Morrison's novel because slavery is not transient. Slavery lasts forever. This is also a great contrast within the poem itself with all of the uses of forever. And this depicts a newfound hope for the speaker that there is a better life out there for him. And we also see a shift in the tone of the poem through the use of the different punctuations following each of the forevers. It starts off with question marks, and those represent the despair and the doubt of the speaker as a result of his enslavement. But then ultimately, we see that the forevers end with exclamation points. And those symbolize this new hope and excitement for the life that is to come because he believes that there is a better life than slavery out there for him. And again, this is something that we haven't seen in Beloved. I mean, I know I haven't seen any glimmers of hope or true resolutions to the consequences of slavery. So that's definitely something that I'm going to keep an eye out for as we finish this novel, and I know they will too.